about those little pieces of paper and uh, pens that are on every seat or almost every seat. Um, hold on. Uh, there, there's something coming up. It's, it, it's a participatory sermon this week. So, and no, you don't get to write the points. Yeah. Uh, no, no. Uh, this is rooted three, and we answered or tried to answer a big, big, big question. And then, how does God speak to us? Now, as I shared with Bible study this morning, uh, if you're like me, you you know, you start to talk about this question, particularly if you, you hear from somebody that says, God spoke to me and said, red flag story. And, and most of that is just, it, it, it's history for me. Because I've heard some pretty wild stuff from people. I mean, really crazy sort of stuff. And then you, you see the things on, on you know, the news that people say, well, God told me to do this. Um, really, um, to shoot up a mall and kill everybody? No, that, that doesn't fit the scripture. It, it just makes you nervous sometimes when you hear people say that. But you know that God, because we read the Bible, don't we? We know God speaks to us. So how do we how do we get through all of this? Hey, get through our nervousness, kind of you know deal with the hinky part of it, and, but at the same time, honestly, just learn how to listen to God. So let's see what we can do. And, um, now I'm going to mention last week's sermon again, and yes, it, we didn't record it. Just so sad for those of you who weren't here. I mean, it was the sermon of all sermons. It was one of the. It was the best sermon I have ever preached in my life. Colleges heard about it and they're wanting to use it, and you guys can't have it because it didn't get recorded. You no, know, last week we we talked about who is God, and, uh, and and we used nature as you know just. You take and you look at the universe, you look at DNA, you look at us, you, and, and you just look at, uh, as I said, it, it's as if God, like a, a, uh, a guy wild, crazy in love with a gal, finds the overpass and she drives under every day as she goes to work and he paints on the side of the overpass, I love you, Beth. And it's as if God has done the same thing with us, I love you. And he's painted this overpass, and it's called the universe. And we just get to, to look at that. That's our intro for point number one. Romans chapter 1, verses 19 and 20. For what can be known about God is plain to them. And he's talking about the world. Because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. You know, so that's, that's Paul's way of introducing the book of Romans, and he's just saying, you can't say there is no God. You just, you can't. On, on the flip side of it, like, like we talked about last week, you know, this is a love. You know, God loves us. And this is a love expression that he has demonstrated himself. Um, come on, kids, I want you to see me. See me. And so he makes himself evident in creation, right? And, and, and that's, so that's point number one. God reveals himself in nature. That's one way that he speaks to us. You know, when I lived in Montana, it was not 60% of the folks in Montana claim no religious affiliation at all. Only 40% do. And of those 40%, very few actually attend church anywhere. They just say they believe in God. But uh, they don't identify going any place. And they don't want to. And, and mostly from the guys, I would hear this sort of thing. Well, you know, I get my worship of God out in the woods. You know, when I'm sitting in a deer stand and you know, I'm worshiping God. And I'm thinking... Yeah, right. And if that's your only... You can. Don't get me wrong. 
I, there are points in my life, standing on a beach in Florida during a storm, I just, man, you feel the power of God. You just marvel at, at, at His might. And here's this storm, which is not even nearly as powerful as He is, and you realize He created everything that goes behind it. He just spoke it into existence. It just gives you that moment of wonder at how big God is. But if that's if that's the extent of your worship, I mean, you're leaving a lot on the table, aren't you? And, and let's find out what the, the rest of that is. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Two very, very important verses. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work. It, now, for some of you in today's culture, you're going to look at that, and you might take exception to one of the words. And it says, every man. It doesn't, says, it doesn't say everybody. Um, and so you might take exception to that, you know, toxic masculinity. And I just want to point to you, my, my little point about the rolling pin this morning. Maybe there's some toxic femininity, too. So, 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 so let, let's keep this in perspective. But no, what's that say? Here is God's word. And, and look at what it's good for. You know, I, I love working with wood. And, and Fidel and Cindy were at the house yesterday, and, and I gave them a tour of my workshop. And both of them said, man, you've got a lot of stuff in here. I mean, there's a lot of tools in here. And it's... And it's a 14 by 36. It's it, actually that's considered a mid-sized workshop, but there's a lot of tools in there. And if if I'm doing something and there's one particular tool that I, I need in order to do that work, but I don't use it, I mean you can tell, can't you? And it's the same thing with God's word. But when we get you know, to the point where we think it's just a little Maybe too confusing. Or, 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 or it's too hard. Or we've chosen the wrong time of the day to read it. You know, which is one of the real big issues why we struggle with God's Word. Um, you know, it's 10.15 at night. And you go to sleep at 10.16. And you decide that's when you're going to read the Bible. And you're wondering why your eyes are closing. And your conclusion is, well, the Bible is boring. You know, maybe you should have chosen a different part of the day for it, right? Or, and I know, particularly in our area, some people are just, I mean, there's certain translations of the Bible, they think it was handed down by Paul himself. 1,300 years before English even appeared on the planet. But God handed that translation down. And you need a college education in order to understand it. And, uh, and the words are antiquated or whatever, you know, get a life. Go to the Bible bookstore and pick the same passage and read it out of several different translations. And the one that really just pops for you that you say, well, oh, I can understand that. Guess what? That's probably the best translation. Don't ask somebody like me what the best translation is. I've got my own opinion. And what might be good for me isn't necessarily good for you. Because if, if we can believe the Bible, and by the way, I think we can, think about what this says. His word, his word is one of the ways he communicates to us. And it's breathed out by God. I mean, it, it, it's part of him is basically what that says. It's profitable for teaching, which is what we're doing right now, right? For reproof, and sometimes, yes, you do need to be corrected. For correction, yeah. yeah. And for training in righteousness. We want to be better people, don't we? Don't we? Yeah. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So one of the ways that God speaks to us is through his word. Just, well, we'll, we'll get to this in a second in a second. This helps, by the way, helps us 
when we've got somebody that comes to us and they say, um, God told me to do this, and you take and you think, that doesn't sound like the Bible to me. That, that's how we measure those sort of things. But it, there's more to it. Um, John 14. And I will ask the Father, that verse 16, I will ask the Father and He will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, you know Him, for He dwells with you and will be, what's the word? In you. In you. Here's the phenomenal difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And by the way, you know, one of the charges that uh, preachers get, because everybody wants to, they want to plan your sermons for you. I shouldn't say everybody. You do get a lot of people that just think, you know, we're just really struggling, preacher. Uh, we, we think you need to preach more on how people need to live, or you need to preach more about politics, or you need to do this. You need to beat people over the head with it. And a lot of times they use the Old Testament. You, you do know what the New Testament says about the Old Testament, don't you? The Old Testament is, it, there's no doubt, it's godly principles. It's how we are supposed to live. But remember what Paul says and the writer of Hebrews says. Here's the problem with the Old Testament. It was an appeal to human will. And guess what we discovered after thousands of years of trial and error? Humans don't have the will to obey God's word. It's just impossible. That's what, that's what Paul says in Romans. He says, you can't do it. Uh, Romans 7, remember that whole argument? The things I want to do, I don't do. And the things I do want to do, I, you know, the things I don't want to do, I do. And the things I don't want to do, I do. Yeah, you know, the it's confusing. It's just confusing. And then he gets to Romans chapter 8, and he says, therefore now there is no condemnation. And he talks about the man of the Spirit, which is really what Jesus promises right here. See, we, we can't obey the Old Testament. If we, if we go out and club everybody over the head out there about obeying the Old Testament without giving them Jesus, we fail. You're trying to tell people they need to operate by principles, and you haven't given them what God gave us, and that is Jesus and grace and the Holy Spirit to dwell within us, by which we can live the Old Testament principles. Do you see how that works? You know, don't try and change people's politics by making them obey something that even God says you can't obey. But I'm going to come, I'm going to clean you up. I'm going to make you a tabernacle. Hey, I, I don't need one in Jerusalem anymore because you're one and you're one and you're one and you're one. And my Holy Spirit is going to clean house and he, because my son, his blood is going to cover that tabernacle. And he's going to make you pure. Not again, for the first time. And then I'm going to come in and I'm going to live inside you and guide you, speak to you. And all you'll be new. No wonder in the Old Testament he promises I will give you a new heart. Take the heart of stone that is within you that cannot obey my principles and I will give you a new heart. I will give you a new spirit. That's how God speaks to us. And by the way, the two work together. So when somebody comes to you, and, and this is what we, I've made reference to this in, in Bible study this morning, um, you, you know, it's the best example I've ever had of how when folks come to you and they tell you, God told me to do this, and it doesn't fit with uh, uh, Scripture, this was a perfect example. Husband, a, a husband, and wife, but not husband and wife to each other. Sitting in an office at a church in Florida, I was an elder at the time, speaking with the minister and all the elders. And the elders are just chatting to, with them 
about their inappropriate relationship. That appears to be inappropriate, but we're really concerned and, and, and guys, what's going on? And it starts off, well, her husband's a jerk and so-and-so has come to me. And he's counseling. He's helping. Really, you delve deeper and you delve deeper. Well, his wife is an idiot. And he's decided to leave her. And she's decided to leave her husband. And they want to get married. And they want to dump their husband and wife. Why? Because God wants them to be happy. So, amazing. Well, I don't remember reading that in the Bible. Yes, you can get a divorce, but only because of your hard hearts. I will allow divorce if you violate the marriage bed. And if you just want to be happy. Do you remember that one? No. I, yeah. Okay. So, do you see when people say strange things, and they're saying it's the Holy Spirit, but it doesn't seem to match what we read here? That's our balance, isn't it? Because this is the only thing that we can really, truly trust on earth. You know, I've got some people in here I love to death. You're wrong a lot. And I know you guys love me. But I'm wrong a lot. This isn't wrong. And we need to have them work together. But, the, but that's not everything. We have His Word, His Spirit. And, um, and then in Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 17 and 18. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for the saints. So, so what is Paul telling the Ephesians? The Bible and the Holy Spirit work with them as part of the power of God. But then here's here's a big Matthew chapter 6. In the midst of the Sermon on the Mount, right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He teaches his disciples how to pray. Matthew chapter 6, right literally in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. And when you pray, Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites. For they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, Go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard with their many words. Do not be like them, for the Father knows what you need. When? Before you ask Him. Pray then like this. Let's do this together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts. So we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, um, now it makes you wonder, doesn't it? about that prayer, that we treat it so much like a prayer. Um, we even call it the Lord's Prayer. I just want to <coughs> tweak your thinking a little bit. Do you know what many people call the model prayer? Because that's all it really is, is a model. It's a pattern. And you, just like Jesus was instructing at the beginning of that, you know, we, we, we don't just repeat it mindlessly, thinking it's magic. You know, it just kind of heals. It's a model. It's, it's kind of a skeleton. And we're the ones who start to put some of the loot on it. Isn't it? The, the Lord's Prayer. You want to find the Lord's Prayer? John chapter 17. That's Jesus' high priestly prayer. And he prays for us in John 17. He prays for himself. And then he prays for his disciples, these guys, these apostles that are going to go out and 
all but one of them is going to die a horrible death. And one of them lives the old age. I think they needed prayer. But then he prays for us. That's, and again, you know what the theme of the whole thing was? Unity. Um, 45,000 different denominations and sects and Christianity. Then. I think there's something wrong with that picture, don't you? If the Lord on the 90s betrayed, prayed that we would be unified. Crazy, isn't it? And I think that's part of what we need to remember here. How does God speak to us in prayer? I don't know about you, but when I speak with someone, because prayer is that thing. It is us speaking to God. But when I'm talking to someone, especially a long conversation, what starts to happen? You start to discover something about the person on the other end of that conversation, even though they may not say much. And it's the same thing with prayer. The more we share with God, the more we pour out to God, the more we just talk to Him. Number one, He delights in that. But number two, we're changed by it. And real prayer, not pattern prayer, but real, real prayer, just getting honest with God, man, we change. Richard Rohr, who wrote a book, It's Falling Upward, says this. Prayer, and, and I would uh, just adjust what he says. He says, is sitting. I would say it can be. Prayer is sitting in the silence until it silences us. Have you ever tried that in prayer? Choosing gratitude until we are grateful. That's prayer. And praising God until we ourselves are in act of praise. Which is interesting, isn't it? In church, one of the biggest fights in churches is about worship, praise, music. And it's so contradictory to what Richard Rohr said. Because if we're truly coming in here with gratitude, if we're really truly coming in with praise, it changes us. And then we become praise. So here's what we're going to try this morning. I really want us to, this week, as we go into rooted and we study the devotions, as we read our scriptures, as we come together on Wednesday, as we commune together, let's really explore this. God is speaking to us, both in the scripture and the lessons with one another, His Holy Spirit. And by the way, there is an additional component of God speaking to us. He does speak with us collectively. So we learn sometimes about God from one another because they've got the Holy Spirit in them. And they're reading God's scripture. And sometimes another person's walk is farther along than mine. And I can grow from that. Like Richard Moore, that was a great little quote, wasn't it? So here's what we're going to do. That, the little sheets of prayer, uh, paper. As I talk, and I'll give us a second for us just to be silent. As Richard Moore said, I want you to write down a prayer to God. Just a concern or something. You know, maybe you're one of those people who wants to hear something. I'm thinking of our brother Bill this morning, who's just he's hurting and he just needs prayer God prayer. An elder's wife in Montana, I just got word this morning, an elder's wife in Montana um, went to Mayo, and there's a tumor on her brain. And so they're going and they're talking treatment for that tumor. Also got word this week that there were um, three elders from a church in Indiana who flew out to Pine Haven Christian Children's Ranch in Montana, and the plane crashed on the ranch and killed all of them. Uh, leaders within the church. And, and, um, and there's a there's a lot of folks that are just, they've got concerns and they're wanting the answers, right? And 
some of you have concerns and you want your own answers. Maybe it's just a craze. Now, the tin bucket is up there because here's what we're going to do. We'll just go into a moment of silence. And then, if you will, take your little piece of paper, you can fold it up, and I'll fold it up, do however you want to do it. Put it in that tin, and then we're going to pray over that. Collectively. We'll let the strength of a, uh, collectively, all of us, um, just sharing with God, asking God, seeking God's face, our prayer concerns. So I'll I'll start it off. I'll just give us a moment of silence. Father, We spent so much of our lives looking at our phones, staring at a TV, looking on a computer screen. It, it, so many interruptions and it's, I mean, so many things that distract us. By the way, we, we can't even drive cars going from one place to another without these distractions. And I just pray, Father, in Jesus' name, your Holy Spirit has even now given us the moment of silence. So we can be still and know you're God. Father, may this moment be special in another way. That as we write down our prayers, as we write down our concerns, just a word of praise. As we present them to you, we, we just pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit who is dwelling within us just gives us comfort that there is an answer coming. And Father, if it's praise, you too are applauding. That Father, we have the God of the universe who is stopped and is not distracted by anything, but is a paying attention to this group of people in this room in this place and at this moment. We give you thanks that you're that sort of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's do something just really strange. Get you out of your comfort zone. So if you will, just go up and drop it in the bucket. I'm going to be behind. That's our baptistry, by the way, if you're wondering what it is. Um, I'll stand behind it, and if we'll just kind of collect in a little group, kind of, kind of cluster around that wall once you drop it in, and we'll just play over that together.
Let's grab a hand. Yeah, grab a hand. This is cool. Yeah, we get to see each other a little differently and look at the back of somebody's head. Some of you need to hear that. <laughs> I might be one of them. Father, I just thank you so much for this congregation. I thank you for these people. And Father, we just pray a blessing upon our visitors this day. Um, we want to grow. Uh, we want to be what you want us to be. And, and I just pray that, uh, that this helps us get a little bit farther along. That Father, we mature in Christ. That we become what you dream us to be. And Father, we pray for these little bits of paper that they represent our prayers, our concerns, our praises, uh, just the, the things of our heart. And, and Father, may you just, like the Old Testament says, the prayers of the saints, and they be like a sweet incense to you, a sweet aroma. Take pleasure in what you see and what you hear. And we pray for those questions that are asked in here. That Father, in Jesus' name, you answer. We give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You all be blessed. Have a great day.